What was life like in Manhattan before skyscrapers dominated the skyline? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today, we are celebrating the monumental milestone of reaching 100,000 subscribers by releasing our most requested video to date. What happened to Millionaire's Row in Manhattan? Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. When we think of Manhattan, especially Fifth Avenue along Central Park, we imagined towering glass skyscrapers for as far as the eye can see. But it wasn't always this way. When Fifth Avenue was first planned, it was given the name Middle Road and cut through a small town known as Seneca Village, which was mostly inhabited by poor Irish immigrants and middle-class African Americans. But the city of New York was rapidly expanding, and all the green space was being paved over and built up. In 1853, the New York State Legislature acquired the 775 acres that composed Seneca Village through eminent domain to have the town torn down and replaced by Central Park. The city's most elite saw this as an opportunity to create an enclave of beautiful homes lining the park, with space enough to spread out and breathe clean air, reconnecting with nature in the concrete jungle. The first notable family to start the trend of building palatial mansions was the Astor family. They constructed a four-bay-wide brownstone in 1854 to be the largest house in the neighborhood, but would quickly be overshadowed by the neighbors. Mrs. Astor led high society in New York and famously had an addition built onto her house in the form of a massive ballroom, which could hold 400 guests. As the neighborhood developed, she would eventually build a new, much larger house, but we will get to that soon. Across the street was the A.T. Stewart Mansion. He built an empire of emporiums and gained the nickname the Merchant Prince of America. His house was arguably the first marble palace with sumptuous interiors fitted with intricate stonework and decorated with European antiques, some of which dated back to the 14th century. At the corner of 5th Avenue and 57th Street sat the largest house in New York City, the Vanderbilt Mansion, the home of Cornelius and Alice Vanderbilt, at the direction of architect Richard Morris Hunt, the mansion consumed an entire city block, with additional gardens and outbuildings spilling out across the street. Down the road sat the house of William K. Vanderbilt and his wife, Alva. Because the Vanderbilts had just gained their wealth, they were considered new money and were snubbed from society. Alva wanted her house to be so over the top that it would function as a battering ram to break down the gates of high society. Famously, she hosted a ball in this house and did not invite Mrs. Astor nor her daughter. When Mrs. Astor found herself being left out of the social scene, she had to change the rules of high society to accommodate new money families out of fear that she might become a nobody. The Vanderbilt family built so many mansions along Central Park that an entire stretch of Fifth Avenue became known as Vanderbilt Row. One of the most impressive was the Ripple Palace constructed out of brownstone, embracing the aesthetic of New York's architectural heritage. Half of the stately residence was set aside for Commodore, while the other half was divided into a duplex for his daughters and their families. The interior of the main home was used primarily to display the Vanderbilt's vast art collection, and was even open to the public for a short time before closing due to unruly guests. Commodore's other daughters, Adele and Eliza, chose to live separately, so their father had two mansions constructed nearby for them to live independently with their families, but still be close enough to come home on a whim. Commodore's display of wealth at his Triple Palace caught the eye of robber baron Henry Frick, who would later rent a portion of the Triple Palace while building his own mansion down the road. It was constructed entirely from limestone and boasted lavish interiors with a central pipe organ which could bellow throughout the halls. No surface was left unadorned, with intricate ceilings set above wood panels and antique furniture. Frick was such a patron of fine arts that he even had salvaged French panels, which were hundreds of years old at the time, shipped in from Europe and reassembled in his house. The flaunting of wealth became almost absurd, as each person tried and succeeded in outdoing the last. Further down, William Clark, who was dubbed the Copper King after making a fortune in mining, built what would become known as Clark's Folly a sprawling 121-room mansion built completely from limestone in the Beaux-Arts style. The house demanded so many resources, not only for its construction, but also for its upkeep, that William had a private railroad constructed underground to bring materials and resources straight to his basement. Mrs. Astor's brownstone was now looking like a doghouse next to these palaces. She, 
along with her son, purchased several homes at 65th and 5th Avenue to have torn down, clearing the way for their future palace. They hired architect Richard Morris Hunt to design for them a chateau-esque style duplex with mirrored floor plans. In the back of the house sat an even larger, more grand ballroom, which could now hold 1,200 guests. Unfortunately, John did not live long enough to enjoy the house as he perished aboard the Titanic before settling in. Several other mansions continued to pop up surrounding Central Park. It had not only become the premier neighborhood of the country, but of the entire world. The increased demand for a slice of real estate in the area drove the price of land to obscene heights. More economically inclined developers were now building up instead of out to achieve the maximum amount of square footage possible. This was the case for Marjorie Post when investors sought to purchase her home. She declined until a deal could be reached. The developer agreed to build her a penthouse mansion at the very top of the skyscraper he planned to develop. This set off a domino effect. One by one, mansions were torn down and replaced with soaring buildings. And at the top of these buildings, the new concept of living in a penthouse became high fashion. Mrs. Astor's mansion was torn down for Temple Emmanuel to take its place. The A.T. Stewart House became the home of the Manhattan Club, but later sold to a developer in 1901. The New York Tribune reported that the developer would remove the structure at his own expense and have it erected in its present form somewhere in Westchester. But the developer quietly backed away from his promise to preserve the majestic estate and had it torn down, replacing what was once considered the finest home in America with an unremarkably plain office building. William K. Vanderbilt's Petit Chateau, as it was once known, was demolished in 1926 to clear the way for an office tower. After Cornelius Vanderbilt passed away, Alice Vanderbilt sold her house, but after hearing about the prospective owner's plans to demolish it, she began parting out the house, offering salvage to anyone who would take it, including grand fireplaces, wood panels, and even the front gate, which was gifted to the city to be used as a memorial in Central Park. Commodore Vanderbilt had stipulated in his will that the Triple Palace was never to be sold, but as the generations passed, his heirs found a loophole and sold the once lavish estate to the Astor family, who then sold it to developers in the 1940s. Today, several skyscrapers stand in its place, with retailers such as H&M and Juicy Couture overshadowing what was once the greatest private art collection in the world. His daughter's twin palaces were demolished to make way for an office building. William Clark's Folly stood proudly over Central Park for only 16 years, being demolished only two years after William's passing. In its place, a 12-story luxury condo building was constructed. In the name of progress, nearly every single mansion was replaced by developers looking to capitalize on the idealistic area. But in doing so, they erased any memory of the city, which was once known to be more beautiful than Paris. Thankfully, not all was lost. Henry Frick's house survived as a museum, still remarkably intact in boasting his private art collection. In addition, another house survived as a museum. The Cooper Hewitt was once the grand estate of Andrew Carnegie. As you travel around the park, you will find clues as to what life was like at the turn of the century. Sandwiched between buildings and in the shadows of skyscrapers, a handful of row homes can be found sprinkled throughout, and though they were here first, seem out of place amongst the glass and steel buildings which so quickly replaced the neighborhood. For the most part, all we have to remember this gilded age are the photos that were taken before demolition ensued. We have covered several of these homes in detail in previous videos and have placed them all in our Mini Mansions of Manhattan playlist on this channel. Make sure to check it out if there are any homes that you would like to see more of. If you could go back in time and save just one house, which one would you choose? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen and show your support for the production of these videos, please join our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.